Uh, this talk is going to focus, this is the guidelines talk. Talk a little bit about priapism today. Show of audience, uh, show of hands in the audience, how many people have to deal with priapism a couple times a year? Okay, and then how many people love to take care of that? Yeah, there's like one back there. So uh, I'm going to review the guidelines, which is a little bit dense. The slides are a little bit dense. But then we'll talk about some of the ideas that I think there's some room for improvement for the current priapism guidelines, uh, which we'll get into. All right, so there, there's what they are. Let's start with some basic definitions. So remember, ischemic priapism is a, uh, essentially a compartment syndrome. It's a low flow state of the penis. Uh, interestingly, it increases in summer months compared to winter. I didn't know that until I read these guidelines. 13% uh, result in admission. And uh, typically, if, you, you know, if you're a repeat offender, et cetera, you're more likely to get admitted with this condition. This is in contradistinction to non-ischemic priapism, where the penis is neither fully rigid nor painful, and this is not an emergent treatment uh, condition. And of course, there's stuttering priapism as well. How many of you have stuttering priapism or nocturnal priapism patients that you have to take care of? Yeah, so those are challenging guys as well. So we'll get into that group. So step one in the guidelines is to, to determine what type of priapism you have. Uh, basically high flow versus low flow. You can see that uh, physical exam findings are key. Uh, and then basically the uh, blood gas of the penis or uh, duplex ultrasound of the penis can give you the definitive diagnosis, whichever you prefer. Uh, the guidelines recommend, of course, checking a blood gas. Uh, the blood gas has some problems with it because if it's uh, you know, not put on ice immediately, you can get some false readings. Uh, so, you know, uh, so you have to be a little bit weary of that and just memorize what the standard blood gases are for the different conditions. Uh, when you look at the medications that cause uh, low flow priapism, they all conveniently start with an A, or I've edited the names so that they start with an A. Uh, so antihypertensives, uh, anticoagulants, antidepressants, uh, trazodone is the uh, most common uh, medication that causes these things alcohol, and then Amsterdam's finest. I had to look for a term for marijuana. That started with A. That was the only one that I could find. Um, we'll have to see if the Colorado's priapism rates go up over the next few years. And El Prasadil, that's a big cause, right? Uh, urologists giving, or you know, these shot clinics uh, giving these medications. Other things we need to know on workup or history, history of trauma, trying to get at, is there a cause for the uh, high flow priapism there? Uh, obviously ask about sickle cell. And then the most important thing that I think can be overlooked, there's two points. One is, okay, what were the quality of your erections before this all started? How, how much do you care about them? And then finally, how long has this truly been going on? This is very difficult to determine sometimes, right? But by the time they come to you, maybe they've already gotten to one ER, then bounced someplace else, and then gotten home, and then gotten to Hardee's and eaten some curly fries, whatever it is, uh, it's really hard to determine have they had a true priapism for a prolonged period of time or have they had intermittent like treatment of it where it went down for a little bit but then came back. That makes a difference because it all depends on how much ischemia you're gonna get in the penis. Obviously the workup, uh, you're gonna wanna work, uh, rule out uh, malignancies, uh, you know, and blood gas testing is essential. Sometimes you're gonna check that urine toxicology, duplex ultrasound, et cetera. We'll get into some of that imaging later. So, uh, <clears throat> second guideline basically says, um, all priapism gets better, okay? So when I, I don't know, for some reason, like the first 10 years of my career, I thought if you didn't treat priapism, like the penis would fall off, you know? That's the impression that I had. And so I looked in the literature, yeah, there's no reports of gangrene from priapism. It always gets better. It's just a question of, is their penis gonna work again in the future, all right? So that's why it's important if they don't care about their erections, it's a guy in a, you know, psychiatric home or something, and he's not interested in sexual intercourse, uh, you don't have to do anything, right? And then the only other consideration is how painful is it? Well, there's other ways to treat priapism for pain without doing surgery, right? You can get pain medications, for example. So that's a big question. Remember that if you give only systemic treatments, alkalinization, oxygen transfusion, which is not recommended, a third of the people will get better. <laughs> Maybe they would have gotten better anyway, but the people who you treat that alone tend to get more ED in the guys that you target the penis. So the recommendation is target the penis right away. If you wanna do some of these adjunctive maneuvers, fine. But what do you have to do? Well, if you only could do one thing, inject or aspirate, what would you pick? The answer is inject, right? So the AOA guidelines say you have to inject, you plus or minus can irrigate if you wish. So if you just, uh, inject with phenylephrine, 43 to 81% of the time you're gonna have success with or without irrigation. Now, a little caveat on irrigation. 
When you're irrigating out the corpora, you have to think about what is the volume of the corpora. If you have problems remembering, think about like how big the reservoir is for implants. Approximately 100 milliliters, right? After you take 100 milliliters out of the penis, you don't need to keep taking more blood out. I've gone to the emergency room where my residents have been doing some tomfoolery there, and it looks like a bloodbath. There's blood on the walls, there's blood everywhere, because they just keep pooling blood out of the penis. It's like a bloodletting. Yeah, this is not fixing the problem. So there it is. And then probably when you use sympathetic memetics, uh, you're less likely to have recurrence with if you just use aspiration alone. So that's the first line of things. What injections should you use? Well, it's very easy. Phenylephrine. Why? Even though it's not the most efficacious, as you see from the list there, epinephrine works much better to resolve the priapism, but it's the side effects, the cardiac side effects that you can get. With phenylephrine, you have to be aware of hypertension and bradycardia, uh, and that's actually a good thing if that happens. That means that the medicine is, has actually fixed the priapism and is getting into the systemic circulation, and there you go. Your priapism is resolving. What dose should you use? Essentially, five, one to 500 micrograms. I always just give 500 micrograms. And then you need to decrease the concentrations in children or patients with severe cardiovascular disease, again, being afraid of the potential side effects of this medication. So you have to monitor with phenylephrine, especially with guys in cardiovascular risk. Uh, so basically, you just hook them up to the you know, cardiac monitor or in the, in the ER. And again, you're going to see these reflex bradycardia or tachycardia. OK, let's talk a little bit about shunt techniques, all right? Um, who here does T-shunts? Who here does not T-shunts? Anything besides a T-shunt? All right, so a couple still. John, what do you do? I OK, fair enough. So we're going to go over all these different techniques. Uh, you can see here, again, these get a little bit slow, but there's an aspiration technique. There's the Ibejahab, where you basically take a scalpel and you stick it in the penis. <laughs> Uh, and then there you go, there's your shunt. So a T-shunt is just a variation of that where you're taking a much bigger blade, you're driving it into the corpora, turning the blade away from the urethra and pulling it out. That's where that T defect comes from. We'll get into that a little more in a second. That's opposed to the uh, winter shunt where you use a biopsy needle to fire across or the l as Dr. Mohal mentioned, where you actually make a, a dorsal incision. You're going to push the glands down. You're going to basically cut off the tips of the corpora, close it back up. So of these techniques, of the non-T-shunts, the most common probably is the l and is effective. The concern here is you've got nerves in the area, uh, it's a bigger incision, you know, are you gonna have sequelae from that? So most people now are doing the T-shunt as described by Tom Liu with modifications, uh, uh, described by uh, Arthur Burnett with snake or tunneling techniques. You basically create the T-shunt and then you take some kind of a dilator. I like to use the Brooks dilator, and you drive it down that corpora. Okay, so the, the way to make an effective shunt is to make a big opening between the two spaces that you want. A biopsy needle is not a big opening. Uh, the little uh, scalpel blade is not a big opening. But when you take a T-shunt, that makes a very generous opening, and that creates a nice fistula for the priapism to resolve. Whether or not you tunnel or not is sometimes dependent on how long the priapism is a little bit more of a art than a science, so if the, some people say if the priapism is going on for 48 hours, you tunnel both sides, 24 hours, you just tunnel one side. Um, a couple things I, I would mention is that when you make this T-shunt, blood starts hitting the ceiling when it starts working, right? So how do you fix that? Well, you only, you only want to use like 5-0 or smaller on the glands when you suture it shut. You need to do a running locking stitch, otherwise, you can't interrupt this, otherwise you're just going to leak in between there and it's going to bleed like crazy. So running locking stitch and you can stop the bleeding. Uh, and then the next thing is, do you put a compressive dressing on, right? So uh, I'll get to that in one second. So what about oral medications for priapism? Well, basically, the, the, the guidelines say there's nothing that you should use in the immediate uh, time. There is some weak evidence saying that if you give terbutaline in guys who give themselves home injections, they're less likely to get prolonged erections, okay? But that's not uh, appropriate for the guys that come into the ER with um, priapism. But what about blood thinner, right? So the goal of uh, this therapy is to create a shunt that stays open for several days so the priapism can resolve and you don't kill the smooth muscle of the penis and get future erections. So this is work from Tom Liu. Essentially, he gives all his guys aspirin and sub-Q heparin when they get there before their shunt. And then he puts them on uh, aspirin and Plavix for five days afterward, and then he stops it. He, for his, you know, advice, this has never failed him, 
He's, he thinks the reason people fail is because they get an, uh, a shunt, probably not a big enough opening. They, they get a compressive dressing, and then the body just closes it off because it's compressed and it coagulates. So what we want to do is prevent it from coagulating. So that's why I think this is a very smart idea and represents maybe a paradigm shift in the treatment of priapism. Uh, so something to think about. Let's move on quickly to non-ischemic priapism. Well, basically, you know, this is a much different animal. A uh, patient's going to come in with kind of a softy or maybe 60, 70% erection. There's almost always a history of trauma or perineal injury. You know, observation is the treatment, essentially. And then after months and months, if it doesn't go away, they really want you to do treatment. You can try to embolize it with a high risk of ED. Um, you know, non-permanent grafts are better than using coils, chemicals, et cetera. So that's what the guidelines tell you. And then if that still remains, which I've never seen in my career, then there's very rare surgeries that you're supposed to do, but I've never seen that in practice. Okay, stuttering priapism. So remember that the goal of stuttering recurrent priapism is prevention of future episodes. So how can we do this? Well, uh, Arthur Burnett had some research that says there's some downregulation of PD-5 uh, inhibitors, ex uh, PD-5 uh, sensors, et cetera. So you give daily PD-5 inhibitors, and there is some data. Uh, I just pu I pulled an article out of Brazil this morning where they had seven patients with stuttering priapism. Six of them got better with daily PD-5 inhibitors. In my practice, this has not been a, as effective. Give these guys daily PD-5s, and they co keep coming back with priapism regardless. Another approach which I've had more success with is basically lowering the T to a, a point where the erections, uh, the stuttering erections stop, but they can still have sex when they want. So one regimen to try that is ketoconazole with prednisone, 200 milligrams three times a day, and then prednisone for two weeks, and then just keep going with 200 milligrams of the ketoconazole. And often you'll drop the T to a level where indeed the stuttering priapism gets better, but they can still have sex when they want. Most of these guys, they stay on this regimen for three to six months, then they stop it, and the problem's magically gone. Other guys, they have to stay on this regimen, but the vast majority do, do well long term. If you are gonna use some kind of hormonal manipulation for treating stuttering priapism, remember you don't wanna do this in fertility patients or pediatric patients. You clearly don't wanna affect their growth and that kind of thing. Okay, so quickly review take home points of these giant guidelines. One, you gotta figure out if it's ischemic or non-ischemic. Two through seven, you use a stepwise approach, you inject phenylephrine, uh, and then go from there. Uh, distal shunts uh, can be attempted after ICI fails. Modern distal shunts should work. Proximal shunts are affiliated with complications. We'll get with that soon. Who has done a proximal shunt in the last year? Last two years? Five years? Yeah, so it's, it's becoming more and more rare. I've done one in my career. I did, I think, in my second year. Uh, but since I've started this other techniques, I haven't needed to do it. Um, oral therapies do not work, question mark, aspirin, plavix for the treatment when you do shunt them uh, and the other things we talked about. So here's some changes to consider. Number one, I really think it's important that we get a good idea of baseline ED status and desire for sexual function. I feel like the, the guidelines do a very poor job of saying it's okay to do nothing. When I say do nothing, I mean give them supportive measures, give them pain medicines and say, go home, this will get better on its own. We're not gonna do a surgery because it's been four days, we're not fixing anything, right? The only thing we're doing is a surgery that's maybe will decrease your pain, but that I think is debatable. So that's one thing we need to consider. Another thing is adding blood thinners to when we do shunt. The other thing is minimizing proximal shunts. So, you know, the AUA guidelines themselves say proximal shunts are affiliated with uh, morbidity and complications. And by the time you're doing proximal shunts, a lot of times, the smooth muscle is already dead. So what are you sh what are you saving? And you're putting them at risk for like cavernosal uh, infection or fistulas between the urethra and the cavernosa, which are disasters. The other thing we need to think about is if we get these patients coming in for a prolonged period of priapism, 48, 72 hours, how can we better stratify them into A, doing nothing, B, uh, maybe getting away with shunting them or even injecting if you're lucky, or C, putting in an implant right away? Because we know there's ways to determine if the smooth muscle is already dead. So a little bit more about proximal shunts. So many experts believe that proximal shunts uh, are inferior to the T-shunt with tunneling. So why would you ever do it? Uh, by the, like I talked about, by the time you get to them, often the smooth muscle of the penis may be dead. And then per the guidelines themselves, these are cons time consuming and challenging. And there are the different, uh, different types of uh, proximal shunts. Uh, I've done the, uh, you know, the quackle shunt is the one that I've done historically. And all what you're doing is, you know, you're exposing the corpora and the spongiosum and you're making like a 
like a little diamond slit in both and you're sewing them together. It's a very narrow, small opening. Compare that to this giant channel you're making when you take a dilator and you stick it all the way down the corpora. If you do an ultrasound after you do this tunneling, you see this giant area for the blood to actually be able to drain out. So for me, it seems like a much more logical way to fix things. So here's work from uh, David Ralph's group. So uh, what he does with these uh, priapism guys is he gets an MRI. And the MRI in this series of 23 patients was 100% predictive in smooth muscle death of the penis, smooth muscle necrosis. How does he determine this? He did essentially biopsies of the smooth muscle at the time of the episode and then compared it to the MRI results. So he can tell you with 100% certainty if that penis is going to live or not. And this is an interesting MRI because it actually shows one dead and one alive corpora, a rare kind of unilateral um, priapism. So with this information, then, if we know that the penis is dead, if we're able to get an MRI, we can either give the patient supportive measures or uh, if, they want, if they're interested in intercourse, do an implant early because that's the only thing that's going to work for them, right? I don't know. I was, try, I was trying to figure that out. I don't know uh, based on the imaging. So my guess is that this one is uh, the, the al alive one, this one the dead one because it's kind of got, yeah. So what about early prosthesis treatment? Okay, so this is a very interesting concept. So in England, they do it a lot and they stick in malleables most of the time. Uh, in the US, it's not done very often, probably because of insurance reasons. When writing this talk, I actually learned that, you know, you can wait about 20 days after the priapism episode, and it's not any more technically challenging to put in an implant than, let's say if you wait three months, and it's a disaster. Because it's fibrotic, and you can even use cavernotomes, and then you're looking at 10% complication rate in expert hands. But you have 20 days to make a decision. So I think that's a reasonable amount of time to get the insurance to clear them to have a penile prosthesis. Before, I was like, man, if you have to do it in a day, there's no way. But 20 days, okay, fine. What's the problem with this? Well, if you try to put an implant in immediately at the time of the priapism, you've stuck needles in there. It's an, probably an infectious risk, right? So some of, the, treat, some of the, the papers say that immediate implantations have infection rates of about 6 to 7%, 6 to 7% which is arguably much higher than the virgin implant infection rate would be. So that's a disadvantage of putting an implant in right away. The other thing is if you're doing a T-shunt, you've just stuck a hole between the glands and the corpora. Now you're putting a device you know, in the, into the corpora and you're worried that the device is gonna puncture through the end of the penis, right? So if you're gonna put a malleable and some groups have had success with basically fixing the malleable to the corpora so that it can't migrate distally and you know, bust out the tip of the, the, the glands. Tony Bella in Canada actually did a series of five or six of these post T-shunt uh, implants and he didn't have any distal perforation, but it's something to think about which can happen. The key point is if you are gonna put an implant in a post priapism patient, it's a nightmare unless you do it very, very quickly. Okay, so based on kind of why my reading and my experience, I've created this algorithm when I was in the shower this morning, I realized I made a mistake. I was like, oh, that's probably not the right part of the algorithm. But I wrote this in this fancy program on my desktop computer, which I couldn't change, so I had to, had to put a Band-Aid on it this morning. So it's a little bit hard to read, I apologize, but basically you get history, physical, blood gas, good blood cell ultrasound. Now you've determined ischemic priapism. So now I think the time, the duration of priapism, if you have a reliable history, will determine what you do. So clearly less than 24 hours, simple emetic agents, injections, you're probably gonna do just fine. Now 24 to, 48 hour, 24 to 48 hours, the mistake I made in the pathway here is that I didn't say ICI attempt, right? Because you're always gonna try the injection. But the chance of it working after 48 hours of true ischemia in the penis goes way down. That's actually in the guidelines itself. And so that if that fails, then you're going to do a T-shunt and give anticoagulation. Now, if uh, the erection returned uh, and you can't get an MRI, you should get a penile Doppler to see if this is woody fibrosis, which is always a challenging technical thing to do. Is this true priapism return or is it just scar from having a penis beaten up for five days? Then you're going to go to... Uh, you know, bilat a T shunt with bilateral tunneling. Uh, alternatively, 48 to 72 hours, I would say if you can get a penal MRI, that would be best, and then it will tell us if we need, you know, if it's dead or not. If it's not dead, we can do a bilateral T shunt and tunneling. If it is dead, do the, the guy want erections? Yes, let's go with the implant. If he doesn't want erections, send him home with pain meds. So that's the algorithm that I've come up with so far. Uh, still needs some work, but uh, that's all I have today. Thank you.